Hey, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas. It's Saturday morning, my friend, and you are listening to Light Talk. Good morning. This is Zach in Washington, D.C. Today we are discussing magic sheets, challenges we face as designers, tight schedules, has projection design ruined scenic design, professional organizations, and episode three of The Lighting Guy, all on Light Talk. Now, this is David coming to you from the beautiful Belmont Shore neighborhood of Long Beach, California. And if you don't already know, you are listening to Light Talk and we are the Lumen Brothers. That's right. Zach, Steve and David with you today. You know, I think we've done more episodes than Bonanza now. I mean, this is like. (laughs) Oh, I'm sure. (laughs) I'm Hoss. Uh, Who's Joe? And who's, uh, what was Lauren Green's? Oh, Mr. Cartwright. He was always known as Mr. Cartwright. Mr. Cartwright, right. Although, Zach, if you want, you could be Kitty. You know, my grandfather actually owned a casino in Las Vegas called the Bonanza. And Lauren uh, Green was the opening act when they opened the casino in 1967. The Bonanza is a very famous casino. Yeah, it eventually became the MGM that burned down, which is now Bally's. <laughs> That's now Bally's. Okay, en- enlighten me there. Uh, was Lauren Green a singer before he was an actor? I mean, what, uh, what, he, what was his act? I think... From what I gather, he was an entertainer, and that's in finger quotes. Okay. Uh, you know, Money he's a ears. celebrity personality, so maybe yeah. he was like a Kim Kardashian before his time. He was famous for being famous. Listen, wow. if you're going to open a casino named the Bonanza, you yeah. got to have Lauren Green. You got to have Hoss there. Remember Hoss? He had the big hat. Yeah. And Little a te- Joe. A Texan. He was a yeah. Texan. Right. Little Joe was uh, Michael Landon, right? That's right. Michael yeah. Landon, uh, he was Little Joe. And uh, who was Hoss? Uh, Dan Blocker was Hoss. And you had I Robert Purnell. <laughs> who was Robert Purnell? Oh, he was Adam, the other Adam, brother. The, the first yes. son. Yes. I think yes. now we're the, the Lumen grandfathers. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, welcome everyone to episode 238. And we're going to get started after we're talking about the Bonanza for two minutes with industry news. News, news, news. That's right. And the big news this week is dun, 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 the strike has been averted. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Thank goodness. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, well, people didn't goes. really want to go out and walk a picket line. They just no. want to be treated fairly. Yeah. No, 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 no. And apparently they are now. So that's a good thing. Yeah. Right? I think that the, uh, that, you know, anytime this kind of thing happens, there's always people that feel that they're not getting what they want or it's not enough. But I think the fact that they were able to take these giant companies to task and tell them this is something that has to get dealt with and that these big companies were eventually willing to talk is a good thing. You know, and it's always, you know, especially as somebody who uh, has been through several negotiations to try to get, you know, projections into these collectively bargained agreements, I can tell you that it's sometimes it's baby steps knowing that the next time you'll get more of what you want. But it's like, how do I get my foot in the door? Well, that's what we do with the Lord contracts. Yeah. Because I was, believe it or not, I was part of the very first bargaining team for the Lord, uh, USA Lord Agreement, and uh, the collective bargaining agreement. And that was really interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was more there as an observer because at the time I was the Florida business rep for USA. Oh. And they brought me in and, you know, just more like experience. And it was really super interesting. So I got to meet a lot of cool people and uh, a lot of the general directors of different Lord companies. And uh, it was and we just wanted to get in there. Yeah. So a lot of people complained about the Lord agreement, the original Lord agreement. But look, it got us in there. And, it, and now, you know, as predicted, it's gotten a lot better over the years. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's good news. So the strike has been averted. I don't have to go on picket lines. I don't have to do anything like that. And uh, that is great. So you remember USA, aren't you, Zach? Yes, we can yes, talk about okay. that when we get to our uh, all oh, about organizations, segment. <laughs> professional organizations, right? I forgot we're talking about that today. Great, so let's get started. Steve has our first listener question. And it comes from William in Kentucky. And William writes, what do you see as the greatest challenges your profession faces today? Okay, so I thought about this a little bit, and I'm going to say I'm serious. <laughs> I think it's healthcare. I I mean, for freelance designers, for out there, you know, being a migrant worker 
floating from theater to theater, doing rock and roll tours. I think it's healthcare. I think that is the biggest challenge we're facing today. It is incredibly expensive, and it's absolutely rock bottom needed by everybody. So if you're fortunate enough to be in the union, then you know you, you've you've got a little traction there. But there are a lot of really talented designers who are not union members, who are just kind of you know getting by by the skin on their teeth. They look at a show and the show is paying them two or three thousand dollars. And what is the real profit on that show? And now we're getting down to paying rent and paying off your student loans, and all of a sudden healthcare. You know, it can just devastate you if you don't have it. So I'm, I'm going to say healthcare is the biggest challenge uh, in our profession today. Just to follow up on that, Steve, and uh, Zach, please help me out because I know you and I are sort of in different positions when it comes to healthcare. At least it was, you were until you got your new job, right? <laughs> That's true. Because you got a good health plan now. But That's you true. were, for, for, for many years, you were dependent on your work, on your design right, work. Right, right. On the employers' contributions in the, for our pension and welfare through the union health insurance. And isn't it true that you've got to earn a lot of money a quarter to be able to be covered under that health insurance? Uh, Is that correct? Well, it's it's the way that the health insurance... I, first of all, I want to say I'm not a health insurance rep, so I'm hoping that none of the listeners will call up their local union reps and say, but Zach said... Um, well, just call Zach. Right. Okay, yeah, just call me. I'll handle it. Um, <laughs> so the way it works in the union to get health insurance is you for a certain number of quarters, you have to earn a certain amount in order to qualify to get health insurance. So it's sort of like once you've flipped the switch and you're able to get health insurance, um, at that point, you have the option, depending on how much money you're actually making and how many, how much you're getting in contribution from your employers, you have the option to pay out of pocket to make up the difference. So like if you're lucky enough to have a hit show, you might be getting residuals every week and that might fill up the, I can't remember what they call that, but there's like, imagine there's a big jar and, uh, and you know, <laughs> the you're, coffers. Yeah, the coffers. you're, Fill you're in the, the coffers. The, the, <laughs> you're the designer for Les Miserables. And after a while, every qu quarter, you're covered by the pension and welfare that you're getting in your royalties or something like that. And you don't have to pay anything out of pocket. Um, but if you, you know, for the average designer who has to work regionally and has to schlep all over the country to make ends meet, you know, paying rent on this apartment that you're barely ever in, uh, you're probably also looking at a quarterly bill to keep your health insurance going. So you have some contributions, but it may not be enough, uh, especially if you have, you know, a, a family health insurance plan. But at the same time, uh, you know, it's sort of important. I look at it like, you know, when I started out, projection design was not part of the union. So I had no access to health insurance unless I was going to buy it privately. And even paying out of pocket in this way is better or more affordable than that. You know, buying private health insurance or at least buying private health insurance in the early 2000s. Um, but and I would agree that I think that it's a combination of health insurance and self-care uh, and the, how they work together, that those are uh, it's a big challenge. And, and I think we're doing great work. You know, there's this movement to abolish the 10 out of 12 and to have a five day work week, because I think that part of the self-care that we face as designers, which is a big part of what the strike that was averted was all about was this having time to take care of your like daily needs and like i'm not saying your daily wants like being able to go out and get a you know a latte or a croissant but like having time to pay your bills having time to make sure you get enough sleep if you have a health issue having time to go to the doctor you know we don't we don't really have sick days uh, as freelance theatrical designers and, and or, you know, so so being able to have time to actually take care of those things so that we can continue to work at the level we want to work at, I think, is a huge challenge. Well, you know, that's a great point you brought up about self-care. I'm happy to see the activism that's happening now between no more 10 out of 12s and, like you said, the five-day work week, which seems like no-brainers. Right. <laughs> but unfortunately, it's embedded in the culture of the theater. And I've seen kickback already from producers and general directors who are saying, 
well, that means that our rent, you know, I'm paying rent for a theater for two nights a week. That's now going to be dark, you know, right. that weren't dark before. What am I going to do? Raise ticket prices? So I'm going to charge like $800 a ticket now to see like Waiting for Godot, the musical. Right. He's <laughs> you know, still not like, coming. <laughs> which he's, he's not going to show up. He shows up in the sequel, I heard, but he's not showing right. up for Waiting for Godot. But the thing is, is uh, where do you draw the line? And I think that is the greatest challenge right now. Yeah, I mean, I used to pride myself in my ability to push myself through. And like, I remember I trained myself to be able to like go back to my apartment, fall asleep, wake up and go back to the theater. And I was like, I know that they have a coffee break at 10, 15. I'm going to have my coffee then so I can just like maximize the amount of time that I have to sleep in between, which was maybe six hours or five. So for a long time, I think we sort of wore that as a badge of honor. But now we've all come to realize, especially as we've gotten older and uh, have more responsibilities in life that we're not really taking care of ourselves when we do that. When we're well rested and we don't have all these other things on our mind distracting us, we do better work and we're more efficient. And so in the long run, uh, the more humane work hours, I think, is only going to be a good thing. This next question comes from Arthur in Roslyn. Do you think that projection design on Broadway will change how we think of scenic design on all levels, Lort University Community Theater, or another way, now that the box is open, is there no going back? <laughs> the box is open. Pandora's box. No more projections. <laughs> I remember when we did shows and we didn't need projection. That's you know? right. We used <laughs> Linebox projectors. Remember Linebox? Yeah, little by you put the slide in front of the light. It has yeah, like yeah. a little light box, yeah. and then you put the slide in, and then it would project that. That was enough. We don't need animation. Well, we don't need any I mean, of that stuff. I mean, we've talked about this on the show before, about how Robert Edmund Jones <laughs> knew way back in the 40s that somehow incorporating the moving image was going to be a thing in theater. But I think we can all agree that he didn't say in his book it will be the only thing. <laughs> That's true. Um, so uh, I think it does change the way we think about scenic design. I think that, uh, you know, in some ways it makes it more accessible to people that might not have the ability or the money or the skills or the, the, the supplies to build real scenery, like especially at like a high school level or a community theater level. And I think that it has expanded our idea of what we can accomplish on stage in terms of like special effects or uh, transitions. But I think that ultimately as storytellers, that there's, a place for projections and a place for no projections, you know, that if the story doesn't need it, then really it doesn't need it. You know, one of the things that I always find myself saying when I'm working on a show is, am I making a movie here? Because I want to make sure that the audience is still having that communal theatrical experience and that I'm not taking away from that. So I think that it's quickly become uh, an essential storytelling device. But I think that you know, like we've seen with um, American Utopia, that you can have some chains and some gray suits and some lights and some instruments. No and that's all you need. Right. Yeah, that's all you need. And music and great yeah. music. Yeah. Uh, you know, I have a question for you, Zach, because this, uh, this has a lot to do with it. You know, back when Moving Lights first came out, and this is in the days before you were born, uh, when the first Verilites came out. I was and I born started, then. I was, working. <laughs> I was a kid. No, it's, it's, it's Driscoll that wasn't born, you know. That's true. Ah, it's Driscoll. He's younger. Yes. Right, right. Okay. He's younger. Uh, I'm sure Steve can relate to this. You know, when you first started to use Verilites on productions, there was some directors who fell in love with the technology. They went nuts. They said, oh, can we have the lights do this? Okay, we do this? And then I'm sitting back there saying, I'm not even listening to the words anymore because I'm looking at the damn lights. Right, right. Yeah. So I had to pull back the director. Did that ever, the, I bet that happens a lot in projections Oh, absolutely. Now. I mean, I think that, you know, they always jokingly say in the movie business, you know, we'll fix it in post. That <laughs> we have a projection version of that now that like, I'm, you know, I'm not trying to say that some designers are lazy, but that will be in the collaborative process and they'll just be like, oh, I didn't design that part because you'll just fix it with projections. 
you know, <laughs> you'll just yeah, you'll right. just do a projection there, and that'll that'll be great, and we won't, and it'll fix everything. Or like you know, uh, the the writer will say, well, you know, I know that we have to go, we have sixty different locations in this play, but you'll fix it with projections. Um, so there's that end of it. And then there's the other end of it where like you have people who've learned like just enough catchphrases to be dangerous. <laughs> and they're, they, they're like, I, I know this word lumen. I know this word like, uh, you know, brothers. Yeah. Yeah. I know resolution. resolution. I've heard the word raster before. And then they start throwing all these terms out and you're just like, can we talk first about what the story is or what the content is? And then let me worry about what resolution it can be, you know, cause yeah, everyone's so like, you just, you just taught them the word content now. Well, it's your fault. <laughs> yeah. But like, you know, <laughs> they're like we we need to we need to have a 4k resolution on this projector and then but we're projecting into a black brick wall <laughs> it's like <laughs> right. you, you don't need it then <laughs> so i think that uh you know and, and like several of the designers that we've had on here like wendell harrington and myself and i'm sure elaine mccarthy and others have said there that we've had job interviews where we knew right away like this show does not need projections and do we want to be the person that like forced it in there? But my question, Zach, is when you're on a show and the d director turns to you and says, can we have more happening here? Mm -hmm. And you know, in your theatrical sensibility, that by doing that, you're going to distract from the story. How do you tell the director that? Uh, well, um, sometimes you try to be honest and you try to figure out, like, let, we'll talk to the director. What is it that you're missing? that you're trying to get. And I got to tell you that like 85% of the time, a sound effect fixes it. <laughs> you know, I did a show once where I was projecting this sort of rooftop thing on the deck and the two characters were up on the deck and the director was like, maybe we need to see some other buildings. And I was like, what if we had a sound effect of a bus going by? And then the bus goes by, and I think they threw a little cat thing in there, too, because sound designers like cat noises. What, did the bus run over the cat? No. I just want to point out <laughs> that you're now you're now just as bad because you've said we can fix it with sound. Yeah, but but what I was what <laughs> right, I was getting no sound at. sound designer on the show right now, right. so we don't have to worry about in, that. In our hypothet that. hypothetical magical show. But what I was what I was getting at with this director was what is the thing that's not working for you in our storytelling here and that you know i think we're trying to have a visual language where in this case it was very simple lines so adding other stuff i didn't think it was going to really help tell the story visually but i knew that he wanted to establish that it was like nighttime and we were outside on a building rooftop and that maybe a little soundscape would actually help tell that story uh, in a m much less obtrusive way than than having this other stuff. Because that kind of thing was, in my mind, it's fleeting. It comes in in the transition. It sets up, this is where we are. If we have to look at all this other stuff for the entire scene, then it's like what you said before. I'm just looking at that, trying to figure out what's going on. Where are these buildings? What kind of buildings are there? Is anyone going to come out and go on the other buildings? You know, and then I'm lost at that point. So I think the big thing to do is to really, you know, try to dig down. What is it that you're missing that you think projections is going to help fix? Sometimes I'll just tell the director, you know, I'm really not listening to the words anymore. Right. Because that's one thing I always tell my students is that you have to watch the show when you're designing the show like an audience member. And you have to say, mm -hmm. is this distracting? Is it not distracting? And be honest. And to be honest with the director, I, I don't, you know, I think this is fighting it, you know. It's hard, though, because the director says, well, I really want it. Okay, then you give it to the director. Right. It's the director's, you know, just well, People like lighting and video designers like us, we have a different challenge than like a set designer because sometimes when we get into the theater, if there's a problem, they can't redesign the scenery or like say, OK, let's get six more couches. So they look at us because we have this ephemeral, ever changing thing that we're doing. And it's sort of like they're scrambling, like, how do we fix this? Uh, well, you can make lots of changes really fast, so make some. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Can't repaint it. Right. <laughs> so Rebecca from Paris asks, do you have a strategy in dealing with tight deadlines? Uh, my strategy is to 
get the work done. <laughs> I mean, is to organize your life in a way that you can actually get the work done. Now, if you're doing a show that uh, you've been offered a show and it's between two other shows and there's no time between those two shows, um, don't accept the show. Uh, if it's impossible to do, then you just be be honest and say, you know, I'd love to work with you, but I really can't. Or you say, you know, I can work with you, but my associate's going to be there the entire time. That rarely works out well. And uh, I've uh, assisted people like that who did stuff like that. And I ended up doing, making all the design decisions. And even though I was perfectly capable of making the, the design decisions, uh, you, I would always hear in the background, the producer or general director or someone saying, uh, where is John? Isn't, you know, why is David doing this? Have we hired David or we hired John? Right. John is a made up name, obviously. But, you know, that that has happened. So uh, and when you're and when you do have tight deadlines that you can that you actually can meet, you just have to organize your life. You've got to learn how to organize your life and to multitask in a way that you could be working on four or five shows at the same time and you're able to divide your brain up in that way that we're okay from two o'clock to four o'clock. I'm working on this show from four o'clock to five o'clock. I'm working on that show so that you actually, you know, uh, organize your time to do it. How about you, Zach? You're always working on 30 shows at the same time. <laughs> well, how I, many assistants do you have? <laughs> it's For me, it's not necessarily about the assistants. I like to try to work backwards sort of. So I feel like if I know when, like you're thinking about it almost like it's a, a corporate project um when is when is the final stuff due what when does it have to be done by and then take a step back from that and then when do we get into the space when do we start to do our programming and then take a step back from that so i'm figuring out all these things that are the unchangeable parts of it working all the way to the part of it where i'm able to then say okay to get to that final date i need two weeks of something here and one week of something there and those because those are the things that i can control so it's like knowing what i can control and what i can't control and then on top of that i think there's the the managing of expectations as well where you want to immediately get all of the assumptions out of the way so i'm i'm assuming that we don't have any video shoots for this. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So then I know I don't have to make time for that. I'm assuming that the content from this is being provided by so-and-so. Okay. Yes. So I know that I don't have to have that time for research, uh, things like that. So I think a lot of it is sort of taking that quote unquote deliverable date um, and then working backwards for me. And then I can figure out if I need help or how much help I need per project. Uh, and I, and there have been times where I have not been available for a project and a director was like, I really, really want you to be part of this in some way. Would you be willing to like, uh, you know, have an associate handle the majority of it, but you'll come in and like bless it throughout the process. And I have done that. And I think that, um, part of, part of doing that is because in my experience, I've done projects, uh, when I was first coming up, uh, with Wendell Harrington, where she would do that. And that what she was doing was sort of giving me the gift of that relationship with the director who wouldn't have taken a chance on me otherwise. And she knew she couldn't do it. And this way, the director was willing to take a chance on me because they knew if something goes haywire, Wendell will take over and fix it. And luckily it didn't. Um, so there are scenarios where that can work. Uh, there are definitely scenarios, like you said, too, where just becomes why are they both here uh, but I find that that idea of working backwards knowing when you have to be done is the way that I work best in terms of deadlines on that subject when uh, especially for young designers uh, when you get your contract make sure all those deadlines are in the contract yes, yes. so you know when you, your paperwork is due your, your plots due uh, you know all that stuff and make sure that you know when the set design is due so that you can actually start your work as a lighting designer because it's really hard to do a light plot if you don't know what the set's going to be Steve, how about you? Uh, I'm, I'm a list maker. So when I do these things that are back to back, I, I have a list of deadlines when things have to be done. And I'm pretty bad at procrastination. So <laughs> I, mean, I, I you know, write myself notes. You know, Wednesday means this. This is the deadline. I can't push it to Thursday. 
Um, you know, sadly, the people who seem to have to do this all the time are young designers. And oddly enough, it seems like they can't get a job and then they have three jobs at the same time and they can't turn anything down. It's just organization. It's just you've got to be so organized to do it. The other side of this kind of tight schedule, too, is sometimes you just have to slow down and you have to take the one job you really want and do it as best you can because you don't know who's seeing it. You know, is it better to have two things that are kind of three quarters of the way done or one thing that really represents your work the way you want it represented? So that's a decision you have to make, too. You are listening to Light Talk, and today the Lumen Community Players present episode three of The Lighting Guy, The Terror on Stage Right. Hang on to your sea wrench, true believers. It's time for Bobby Danger, The Lighting Guy, starring Bobby Danger, a.k.a. The Lighting Guy, and his two assistants, Bucky and Becky. And now, episode three. The Terror on Stage Right Down at Beaver State Community College, Doc had been asked to come out of retirement and direct a show. Doc was thrilled to trod the boards once more, so to speak, as director of a tired, mid-century, three-act office drama set in a gritty New York City press room between the wars. Doc had been a legend at the school. He was the kind of director you did not say no to. He made it clear up front that he would only direct the play if he could work in the theater with a completed set with props and costumes in place. Bobby Danger had been instructed to light the show with one general time-of-day cue per act and to stay out of the way at night, as it was a closed rehearsal. That's how Doc liked it. No stage lights getting in the way of rehearsal, no tech crew slowing down the staging process, and no prying eyes offering unwanted suggestions. Eventually, the 10 out of 12 rolled around, and the very air was electric with excitement. Bucky summed it up best. Wow, lighting guy, I've never worked this way before. We're starting the 10 out of 12 with a fully produced, staged, and designed show. Becky chimed in. That's right, Pucky. Just like those Eastern European comedy theaters do. Bobby Danger remained silent. He had a troubled, faraway look about him, and he whispered, Bucky, Becky, I have a bad feeling about this. Keep your eyes open. The first act came and went, and an uneasy calm fell over the tech table. However... Midway through the second act, the director stood up and shouted, Hold, hold, everybody stop. I need a moment. And when Doc said, I need a moment, you gave Doc a moment. During the confusion, Bobby Danger, our lighting designer, stepped into a lobby bathroom. In the blink of an eye, Bobby Danger was out of his khakis and fancy silk tie. He was out of his sport coat and he removed his Rolex. Then he slipped into Lululemon yoga pants, a school t-shirt with an angry beaver holding a lacrosse stick. A nickelback do-rag kept his hair in place, and he wore a pair of red high-top sneakers. Bobby Danger, mild-mannered university assistant professor, non-tenured, had become the lighting guy. Returning to the auditorium, Bobby Danger was shocked to see Doc standing alone in the theater. He had dismissed the company to the green room. He had the look of a broken man. Lighting guy, I didn't see you come in. I feel old, lighting guy. I have made a terrible mistake, and now I don't know quite what to do. It seems that over the course of the rehearsal, the stage right work lights had burned out, creating a no-man's land of darkness and shadow. Doc had slowly but steadily blocked the entire show stage left, where there was good, clean acting light. Stage right was now and forever a wasteland void of actors. Lighting guy, I just don't have time to fix the blocking. I'm just going to have to cancel opening night. By now, Bucky and Becky had slipped back into the theater. Becky sensed the looming failure and said, Lighting guy, we have to save the show. It's what we do. Bucky added in, Lighting guy, 
We've never walked away from a show before, and we can't start now. But the clock was ticking down, and Becky could not stop herself. Lighting guy, I'm afraid. Tell us what to do. A single tear rolled down the cheek of Bucky as he switched off the mighty Grand M.A. and restored house lights. Becky took a moment and put away her headset. Even stage manager Tracy, still in a wheelchair from her encounter with Becky at the Tempest rehearsal, had to look away. That moment was all the lighting guy needed. Bucky, Becky, find me a water cooler and put it on stage right, just near the upstage window. Lighting guy, I don't understand. Quiet, Bucky, just do it. For Pete's sake, Bucky, just do it. Do it now, man. Doc said, I get it, lighting guy. I don't have to reblock the show. I will tell the actors to find a reason to cross the stage right and get a drink of water from the water cooler. The journey to the water cooler will propel the action in ways the playwright could not have ever imagined. The water cooler itself will become a metaphor for life and renewal. By now, the full company had slipped back into the theater and had heard the lament of Doc and the pleas of Bucky and Becky. A hush fell over the room. Thank, Thank you, you Lighting Guy, guy for saving our show. show. I don't need thanks, good artist. Wherever there's a dark spot or an awkwardly staged moment or a timely blackout is needed, well, that is where you will find the Lighting Guy. Tune in next month for episode four, My Grandma's Dead. <laughs> I, I just want to say, you know, off the record, all of my lighting guy stories are true. <laughs> of course they are. <laughs> this happened to me, and I, it was the props guy who said, what if I put a water, water cooler, cooler on stage right? <laughs> and the director nice. said, Solutions. He did. He, he said, I mean, it was almost word for word. He went, this oh. is great. And he would, just, he would just occasionally, God bless him, he would occasionally <laughs> yell out, Bob, cross to the water cooler. Go slow. Think about it. <laughs> and now, back to Light Talk. Well, the sound of those rabid ducks tells us that once again, it's time for Let's, Let's talk, talk About. about. And today's Let's Talk About is all about Professional organizations, are they worth joining? What do you think, guys? Professional organizations, I assume we're talking about United Scenic Artists, we're talking about USITT, we're talking about ATHA, we're talking about, oh, what are those other places? Uh, other the American Red Cross. American uh, Red Cross, Salvation yes, the Army. Humane Society. <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely the Humane Society yes. is worth it. Those are uh, charitable but, organizations. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> well, and uh, uh, we can certainly say that, you know, these other organizations are not necessarily charitable, but they have... Good, right. good hearts. They've yes. got good hearts. So are they worth it? I think it kind of depends on what you're uh, using them for in terms of networking and marketing. Uh, as I have ventured outside of the theater world, I have found that a lot of potential clients will use them as a reference point. So they go, oh, well, you're a member of the themed entertainment organization. So that means that you know a certain thing or a certain, you have a certain level of knowledge about themed entertainment that someone who's not a member of it may not have. Um, there's also a lot of... And you say, yeah, I go to Renaissance fairs. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Um, <laughs> Does that make you a themed entertainment person? <laughs> well, I mean, the themed entertainment world is, uh, you know, I, I I will say that in my new position uh, at Luminous Terrain or in a visual Oh, wait terrain, a second. We oh. missed that at the top of the show. Oh, Industry yeah. News. Beep, beep, beep. Industry <laughs> News. Zach, our own brother, Zach Bovre, is now... What's your title? Like I'm head the of director design? of media design at Visual right. Terrain. That's uh, huge yeah. news. How did we forget that? Yeah. Okay. So again, continue. <laughs> uh, so, and and I met the people at Visual Terrain at a TEA mixer in California. There you so, go. Uh, it's, entertainment. Yeah. There's a lot of these things. Uh, you know, when you go to some place like LDI, uh, there's a lot of meetups and things where you can network. And you know, the, if, if obviously. At the the bottom line is if it's some place where being a member of that organization turns into work, then it's good. 
<laughs> um, but there's also a lot of, th- you know, organizations you can join when you want to learn more about something, uh, you know, and I think that a lot of these organizations have really, uh, excelled at sort of pivoting to virtual during the pandemic, which is a really good thing too. Um, because for a lot of us who were not able to work, uh, some of these professional affiliations are really what held us together during that time. And I know that there's all kind of conferences. I think there's a lot of different, uh, really interesting ones for uh, people in the lighting world. I know USITT, as you mentioned earlier, is a is a very big uh, event and organization for people to really meet the stars of tomorrow in a way. Um, and and for people who want to recruit other people, that those organizations are good. Um, there are some that are like sort of way out on the fringe of whether or not it's relevant or they just want to collect some money from you. Um, (laughs) but I think that overall, uh, you know, I can't say that I've ever been hired for a Broadway show because of my professional affiliations, but I can say that they definitely, uh, have, we have a whole page of professional affiliations on our qualifications documents for corporate work. Steve, what do you think? Well, I think um, if we flip this and look at uh, some of our listeners who are at universities, I think professional organizations are really important. I think it is important to go to conferences and present your ideas or be part of panels or to listen to people who are creating um, new directions in design and in theater and technology. I I don't think uh, we can sit home and kind of look at YouTube videos or occasionally join into a Zoom meeting and watch that. I think we've got to be out shaking people's hands, seeing them, listening to them, getting to know them, developing relationships. And those relationships might uh, be something that turns into work or they might be something that turns into friendships and uh, learning from each other or mentorship. So I, I think these professional organizations do a really good job. Um, and I think sometimes uh, people forget what uh, the Southeastern Theater Conference or USITT did for them when they were 18 or 19, and they look back on this when they're 50 and kind of uh, are jaded about it. Uh, where else can you get this information? I mean, one of the great things about LDI is going and meeting all these people and talking to them and seeing where things, where things develop, what things develop into. So I, I think these are important, important organizations to be part of. I agree. I think that LDI is, you know, that's the only reason why I go, well, I, I also do, we also do a podcast in LDI, but, uh, uh, but really the, before the podcast, the only reason I went to LDI was to meet people and to talk to people, uh, not necessarily as network, you know, to network because I already had a career, you know, and I already had jobs, but, you know, just to, to stimulate my brain <laughs> and, and also for students, really important to go to places like USITT and LDI, especially LDI this year. The lucky students that do go there will have these amazing opportunities that they wouldn't have in a normal year. So I highly recommend people going to uh, LDI this year, especially for the portfolio review, because you're going to be in a room with about, I don't know, a dozen professional designers who are all going to look at your work. And that's how you meet them. I mean, I made some amazing friendships and professional uh, affiliations with younger students uh, that were presenting at the conference who said, hey, I'm going to be in Italy uh, are you, and, and they're going to be there. So all of a sudden, you know, they have a connection with somebody, with a professional designer. Or they, they may ask me, what would be a good school to go to? And I would say, well, you'd probably want to check out Steve's school at SMU because what you're looking for, he actually offers that there. You know, things like that, that you would, wouldn't get anywhere else. You wouldn't have that opportunity to get anywhere else. And that was one of the things that the clam bake used to, used mm-hmm. to do. Yeah. Uh, that, that uh, you know, when, when students were, were graduating as graduate students, uh, they would have all these amazing professional designers there talking to them and meeting them and helping them get started. It, ha- it worked for me. That's how I got started. In the, you know, I mean, I was very fortunate. I had like two designers who immediately hired me. 
One gave me a full-time job. The other one gave me a job in uh, Caracas as his assistant. So this stuff does happen. So the more you network, the better. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I'm sure all of us can think of different individuals we've met uh, at these things that have had a significant impact on our lives, you know, and I think that it's a really important sort of hidden gem for our industry in a way that like, you know, you don't learn about them in school necessarily. You're so focused on trying to figure out how to just get my career started and learn the things I need to learn. Uh, so it's really, there, there are really great things out there that, uh, you know, they, you know, like we always say about how these designers are for the most part, very approachable and just being a part of an organization is an, yet another way to, to find how to connect with these people. So do it. Yes. Go out there. Join the organizations. Right. See you at LDI. <laughs> and see you at LDI. So Steve has our last question of the day. And this comes from uh, Long Island. It is Hannah. And she writes the magic sheet. Why not just use the light plot? All the lights are already on it. Why create this extra document? Well, good question. <laughs> when, I, when I was a little Steve, little I thought Steve. the same way, Hannah. Uh, I had not been introduced to the magic sheet. So I would sit there at the tech table in college and I'd have my, my light plot in front of me. Well, the light plot has a lot of information on it. Uh, it's not really organized to quickly glance at and get that information. It's a big old piece of paper. And it's just kind of... Uh, not very uh, user-friendly for sitting in the theater and calling up channels and getting color information. So a light plot is uh, a piece of paper. I usually use something that's maybe 11, 11 by 14 size. And I divide out uh, on it uh, something that looks maybe like a checkerboard, squares, rectangles. And each one of those, I put information about lighting systems in. So I might have a square, and it's and, and I see uh, channels one through five, and then mid stage that's downstage, mid stage I see six through ten, then upstage I see eleven through fifteen. Uh, those are channel numbers for a front of house system, and channel one is downstage left, channel fifteen is upstage right. I put arrows on it showing the direction the light is coming. Uh, sometimes I add color information to that. Uh, on my magic sheet. Um, so I will do that for every system, front light, back light, side light, kickers, whatever. On the magic sheet, I usually put in a color bar on it. So if I'm using a scroller or if I'm uh, uh, putting together uh, colors on an LED fixture, I'll simply have a graphic line of nine colors or 10 colors there and information on how to get to those uh, quickly. Probably on my magic sheet, if I'm using moving lights, I have gobo wheels on there. Uh, I have all the information uh, condensed in a way that, uh, you know, just the facts. I just see what I need to see to program the show with my magic sheet. And usually I'll put a, a page protector over it. So if I have to make changes, I take a grease pencil and make changes on top of the, of the uh, magic sheet. The other thing about a magic sheet that's kind of useful is you, you, as you build your first one and use it, uh, probably at the end of the first tech, you're going to take that magic sheet and restructure it because the way you've laid the information out on it isn't necessarily productive. So for some reason, in the upper left-hand corner, you've put channel 17, which is the conductor special. You know, you probably don't need that in the most prominent place on your magic sheet. It can go down at the bottom somewhere. Or, you know the work lights backstage. You start looking at the real estate and how you want to uh, find information on your magic sheet and you revise it for a couple of days. Eventually you'll kind of find a system that you like and once you've made one magic sheet, it's kind of like a title block. You just keep recreating and plugging new information in. Are there, are there magic sheets, Zach, in projection design? <laughs> I had Driscoll make one for me once when he was assisting me, and it had one projector on it. <laughs> and and was it, was it, did it work for you? <laughs> it was great. But it's interesting because I've always wondered about this. Do you envision that, some, that this could become a digital element? 
or has it already become one? It is digital. Case? I mean, there there are light boards like the EOS system. You can have a digital light uh, magic sheet mm -hmm. on one of your monitors, which is what I use all the time now. I mean, everything is all digital, and you can actually it's a touch screen. You can actually mm -hmm. touch it and activate the channel, and then you know do whatever you want with that channel. What I don't like is using a laptop uh, with an electronic. Uh, um, magic sheet on it because I don't like that lid being flipped up, kind of making a wall between me and the stage. And I'm not too crazy about iPads. Uh, one of my students just did an iPad and um, they were always zooming in and zooming out and trying to find the information. I also don't like uh, the amount of light coming off of a laptop or an iPad. See, that's what I use. I use laptops and iPads. <laughs> but I have an iPad Pro. It's a big screen, and you can you know, pull the light down. You don't have to have a lot of light off. And it depends on how many magic sheets you need. For instance, I have always a separate magic sheet for movers and, uh, and conventionals, different ones, and also what's on that magic sheet. You know, something you said, very interesting, Steve, uh, that your downstage left area is area one, and... Uh, and then your upstage right is like area, I don't know, 20 or something like that. And so you obviously number your channels from stage left to stage right. But do you do the same with moving lights? Um, let me think about that. And I'll um, tell you why. I'll tell you no, why. No, I, 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 I don't. Yeah. Um, I actually reverse the labeling on moving right. lights. So, and to me, that's confusing for me, for my brain. Because when I do a magic sheet, uh, and actually I do this before I do the light plot and I assign channels, is I always think from stage right to stage left, knowing that when I'm lighting the show, I'm actually out front and I'm, and I'm counting from stage left mm. to stage right. Mm. Now, if this was in Israel, we'd be doing it from stage right <laughs> to stage left. But yeah, that's a whole other story. Uh, but, but yeah, that's, that's the thing. And also, I know you were just saying this as an example, but I just want to make sure our listeners understand this. Never assign channel 17 for your conductor special. Do you know why? <laughs> why? <laughs> because you What's want in the a, middle? <laughs> <laughs> because you want a number, a channel number, that right. there's no way in the world <laughs> the programmer's going to accidentally hit it while you're working over a rehearsal. Because if you dump that conductor special out, or worse, the orchestra pit lights, <laughs> oh, yeah. that rehearsal comes to a stop, and the, and the conductor turns around and says... Lights, lights, I, lights. Ad admittedly, my conductor special is 900. <laughs> I would go even one step further than that. If you've got any sort of three-digit number, like, you know, 237 or 238, mm -hmm. I would go to a four-digit number. So it's oh, absolutely impossible, like 1001, channel 1001 for the conductor special, which you could do. It's no big deal. But uh, that's, again, a little safety thing, because, again, you never want to dump those orchestra It automatically out. invokes a production meeting. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. And sometimes a new designer. Yeah. <laughs> but that's really funny. <laughs> Well, the rocking sounds of the luminoids tells us that once again, you've spent another morning listening to Light Talk. You can hear our show on Spotify, iTunes, Google, YouTube, LiveDesignOnline.com, Amazon Prime Music, and just about every podcast site out there. Check out our website on LightTalk.org, and be sure to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our podcast. That way you will not miss a second of Light Talk Insanity. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. However, if you do decide to litigate the law firm of Flecked, Flocked, Flare, and Glare and their paralegal Snoot will defend us until our retirement funds are depleted. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers, coming to you from Long Beach, Washington, D.C., and just left of the Chisholm Trail. And be sure to join us next week when we chat about more useless things and explore the crazy shenanigans in our industry. Light Talk, broadcasting questionable Lumen knowledge and humor around the world. So we'll see you all next Saturday morning. Ciao, ciao from Light Talk. Toodles. Toodles.